So in the last few videos, we've talked a lot about the polyhedral model and about the polyhedral method of representing programs as sets and relations. So in this video, I just want to quickly go to the command line and show you guys uh, an example of what our simple input program would look like when fed into a polyhedral tool, in this case, ISL. So first, just to remind ourselves, let's look at the unoptimized 1D convolution we've been talking about. <coughs> so we have kind of a boilerplate include statement, and then we have a one-dimensional convolution with an input stream and an output stream, and you can read these hardware streams as just HLS representations of ready valid channels. We have a buffer of size 10. We've got a loop that iterates over the input stream, reading in the values and writing them to the ith position in the buffer. And then <coughs> for uh, then we have a for loop which has eight iterations, and it's going to read out three values, uh, three consecutive values from M, sum them up, and write them to the output channel. So if we look at what this program's representation looks in the polyhe like in the polyhedral model, and this rebuild and run script is just running a little uh, preprocessor around ISL, <coughs> we can see, well, once it finishes building, we can see that there's a few different pieces to this program, which we've, mo for the most part, already looked at. So there's two statements in the program, get input and compute output. The program is conv1d. And then we've got iteration domains for statements, and the compute output actually has a two-dimensional iteration domain, but the first uh, uh, the first component of the iteration domain is always zero, so this is just an artifact of code generation, and uh, ranges from zero less than or equal to, or C less than or equal to, greater than or equal to zero less than or equal to seven. And then get input again, actually has two components instead of one like we saw in the PowerPoint, but this first component is just an artifact of code generation that's always zero. And it uh, has values for P and zero to nine inclusive. Then we have our schedules and the schedules have a bunch of redundant components. So uh, these first two components of the schedule vector for get input and compute output uh, are always zero. And then we have one C zero is the schedule for compute output and then zero P zero for get input. So this last guy is also redundant and just an artifact of code generation. But you can see if you ignore those, we basically have compute output C goes to one comma C and get input P goes to zero comma p. We also have information about memory dependencies. So <coughs> the cth instance of compute output reads m2 plus c, m1 plus c, and mc, and get input reads the value in p. And p actually is an input stream, but the tool pretends that p has addresses um, during this analysis. And similarly for the values written by each statement, uh, get inputs p instance reads the value mp, and compute outputs cth instance writes the value out c. <coughs> and we can also ask the tool to take in this schedule and emit loop nests for, that represent this schedule or that implement this schedule for this iteration domain. And the unoptimized loop nest for our program is for this variable name, which is automatically generated equal to zero, less than or equal to nine by one, do the get input zero of variable. <coughs> and then after that's finished, for this variable name that's been automatically generated from zero to seven by one, do the, uh, you know, uh, do compute output or the C3 instance of compute output. So hopefully you can see that this unoptimized loop nest is really just a printout of every element of this set, this iteration domain, in an order that respects this schedule. So every instance of compute output is before every instance of get input because compute output is mapped to 0, 0, 1 comma C and get input is mapped to 0, 0, 0 P and zero is equal to zero, zero is equal to zero, and one is greater than zero. So every compute output is after every get input. And then the uh, statements, the compute output instances are just one after another. So this is the zeroth one, then the first, then the second, then the third, and so on. And similarly with get input. So hopefully you can see that this set of for loops, if you were to run them, 
would execute the get input and compute output statements in the lexicographic order specified by the schedule. And then actually this is also the order of events in our original unoptimized program. So this is just uh, an automatically generated printout which shows the polyhedral representation of the simple program we've been working on. And in the next video, we'll go a little bit more into depth about what we can do with this representation and why this is actually useful. And we're going to start by using this representation to compute the set of all read after write dependencies in the program, or the set of all pairs of statements where one statement writes a value and then later the other statement reads the same value. So hopefully that'll be interesting and give you a taste of how powerful the polyhedral model can be on programs where it's applicable. And so I hope you're looking forward to that, and I'll see you in the next video.